I want to start out these lectures on a theology of biblical counseling by making an assertion that is controversial, and that is that counseling is a theological exercise. Counseling, by the very definition of it, is theological in nature. There's a text that we can think of when we think about counseling and theology in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 to 11. It says, we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers for murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I've been entrusted. There the apostle Paul is talking to his mentee in ministry, and he's talking about sound doctrine. He's talking about theology. And as he talks about sound doctrine and what's contrary to sound doctrine, he talks about uh, all of these really practical realities. He talks about people who are having trouble in their homes. He talks about people who are having sexual difficulties. He talks about people who are struggling with righteousness and rebellion. These are the issues of life that bring people in for counseling and Paul frames all of them in theological categories. When we say that counseling is theological, we're merely agreeing with the scriptures that the practical areas of life are rooted and anchored in the doctrine of God and the truth of the word of God. Now, this is intensely controversial. Most people, uh, most practitioners of counseling do not believe that the categories that are on display in counseling, the kinds of conversations that take place in counseling are theological in nature. They certainly don't believe that they are theologically defined, and they really don't believe uh, that they're the categories discussed in the Bible. Most people believe that Counseling is a relatively secular discipline, that you learn about counseling from categories that get studied at secular universities, at state universities, and they are the categories that are informed by secular psychology. But it is quite true, counseling is theological in nature. That's why I wanted to write the book, A Theology of Biblical Counseling, and why I am so excited about these series of lectures, because I want to show Christians in particular, but anybody else who wants to pay attention, that when God gives us doctrine, when God gives us theology, as it's revealed to us in the pages of his word, he's giving us categories about which to think about counseling. And so if we're going to understand the theological nature of counseling, then we need to investigate two categories. The first thing we need to investigate is the nature of theology. If we're going to understand theology, we need to talk about a definition of theology. And what I want to do is give you a definition of theology that comes not from me, it's not original with me, but it's a definition of theology that is sh that's shared by Wayne Grudem and John Frame. These are two distinct Distinguished theologians. They each have written um, very well received systematic theologies, and their definition of theology is the exact same. That's fascinating because one comes from a Baptist tradition, one comes from a Presbyterian tradition, and so they have different backgrounds, and yet their conception of the understanding of theology is the same. And they define theology this way. It, they say it's what the whole Bible teaches us today about any given topic. Now, I think that is a wonderful definition of theology, and what I want to do is just explain three pieces of it. First of all, they say uh, in their definition that theology concerns the teaching of the entire Bible. Uh, it's what the whole Bible teaches us. And so when we think about theology, we're thinking about the entirety of the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. When we want to understand good theology, we have to read the entire Bible and figure out what God says um, throughout the entirety of the scripture. The second element of this definition that we can pay attention to is that it's what the Bible teaches us today. Now, this is a very important element of their definition because you'll note that some Christians wonder why Christians keep writing books, why theologians keep writing systematic theologies. Um, 
Why isn't it enough that we had the systematic understanding of truth written in the 1500s at the time of the Reformation or in the 1100s or in the 300s? Why is it that every couple of years we have a great big systematic theology come out that's brand new? Why do we always have to keep saying new things? Well, we're not saying new things because the truth changes. We're saying new things because the context in which we speak truth changes. And so it's not enough for us to understand the impact that the Word of God made on Christians 500 years ago or 1,000 years ago or 2,000 years ago. It's not even enough for us to understand the, the impact of the truth on Christians 10 years ago. Because our circumstances and our culture keeps changing, we need to understand what the whole Bible teaches us today. And so so good theology is by definition contemporary theology. And then a third element of the definition is that it's what the Bible teaches us about any given topic. That is, we are interested in what the Bible says about all manner of things. We regard the Bible as authoritative uh, on anything, any topic that it addresses. And so we want to uh, pay attention to topics that interest us, and we want to go to the Bible and find out what the Scripture says about it, indeed the whole Scripture, and what the Scripture says today. And so that is the nature of theology. It is what the whole Bible teaches us today about any given topic. That's what theology is. But if we're going to talk about a theology of counseling and a theology of biblical counseling, then we need to understand the nature of counseling. I relied on the definition of uh, other theologians uh, to carry the freight for our understanding of theology. I want to give you my definition of counseling as we try to understand this part of our investigation. Here's my definition of counseling. Counseling is a conversation where one party with questions, problems, and trouble seeks assistance from someone they believe has answers, solutions, and help. So, there's a couple realities that we can understand about this definition. First of all, when you understand that definition of counseling, you'll understand that people are counseling all the time. Uh, if, if counseling is a conversation between people with questions and problems and trouble and other people with answers and solutions and help, then we're doing that all the time. Uh, I did that uh, yesterday morning. Uh, when my son got in trouble at school and I heard from the teacher about what was going on and I had to sit down and explain to him what he had done that was wrong and why he shouldn't do it again. Uh, school teachers do this uh, with their students. Uh, employers do this with their employees. Wives do this with their husbands. Whenever somebody has questions, problems, and trouble and they go to somebody who has answers and solutions and help, they're doing counseling. You can have a degree to do that. You can be good at it or bad at it. But people People are doing counseling all the time whenever they have these kinds of conversations. Another reality that we can say about counseling uh, and this definition of it is that it's two-sided. There's one party with the questions and the problems and the trouble, and there is another party with the answers and the solutions and the help. In order for counseling to happen in that two-sided equation, you have to have agreement. Counseling won't happen if you have somebody with questions and problems and trouble who does not believe that they have questions and problems and trouble. You can have someone behaving in ways that are very, very personally destructive and they're ruining their life. But if they don't see it, if they don't agree that this is a problem, then counseling won't happen. The other side is also true. You can have somebody with questions and problems and trouble, and they realize that they have those questions and problems and trouble, but if they don't realize that you have the answers and solutions and the help, or they disagree with the answers and the solutions and the help that you offer, then counseling is not going to happen. Another thing that we can say about this definition of counseling is that it does not require that the counselor be any good at counseling. All over the world today, there's going to be counselors, some of them making hundreds of dollars an hour, some of them working for free, uh, some of them thinking they're doing another job besides counseling, but they're going to be offering counsel that's no good. 
Uh, people say horrible things in the context of counseling, and people believe it and do it. Uh, there will be counselors somewhere in uh, the world today that would tell an abused wife to go home to her abusive husband, even though she's in terrible danger. That's horrible counsel, but the counselor uh, doesn't have to be right to be occupying the position of counselor. Uh, we could Imagine a situation where someone would be cruel and unkind to a person broken uh, by the sin and devastation of somebody else, and they would offer counsel that would even further discourage that person and maybe lead to uh, an attempt by that person to harm themselves or take their own life. A counselor does not have to be any good at counseling to be in the position of counselor. Here's another final reality that we can observe about this definition of counseling. You don't have to be good at counseling to be a counselor. You don't have to have the degrees of counseling to be a counselor. What you have to have to be a counselor is some vision of reality. You have to have some worldview, we might call it, that understands the dilemmas and the brokenness of people and be able to articulate that as a response to their dilemma, as a response to their problem. That is to say that all of the counseling that counselors offer, all of their answers and solutions and help are built on a vision of reality, on a worldview that understands life, that understands problems, that understands what's wrong with people, that has some understanding about how to help, and that has some goal of change. That's what counseling is. It's answers and solutions and help based on the counselor's understanding of who people are, what's wrong with them, and how to help. It's, it's wisdom offered out of a worldview. Here is a crucial reality for, for us to understand. Counseling is theological. That conversation has to do with what the whole Bible teaches because that vision of reality, that worldview, is always theological. God knows who people are, and he tells us who we are in the Bible. God is the expert. He is the world's leading authority on people, and he reveals what he knows uh, in the Bible. God also understands what is wrong with people. He's the leading authority on trouble, and he reveals what is wrong with people in the word of God. God also understands how to fix what is wrong. He is a problem-solving God, and he reveals in the pages of his word how to solve the problems that people face. The answers to those worldview issues, what's wrong with people? How do you fix it? What's a process of change? Who are we? Those are all theological answers. Uh, they are all theological realities. The question is not, can you have a vision of reality that informs your counseling that is divorced from theology, that is a-theological in some way? The issue is, is does your theology offer solutions that agree with God's? or disagree with God's? Is your theology expressing an understanding of people that is in agreement with the scriptures or in disagreement with the scriptures? Does your theology of change offer a, a model of change that is consistent with the Bible or inconsistent with it? Does Jesus agree with your worldview or does he disagree with your worldview? We cannot escape the theological nature of counseling. The only issue is whether our theology of counseling is faithful or faithless, whether it's good or bad. And so the job of uh, Christians, the job of Christians who would counsel is to offer counseling wisdom based on a worldview that is as consistent with the scriptures as it's possible to be. And that's where a theology of biblical counseling comes in. We want to pay attention to what God has revealed about who we are, what's wrong with us, and how to fix it, um, and then try to figure out how to connect those answers to people who are in pain. Now, we can't just talk about a theology of biblical counseling because the reality is that when we 
talk about doing biblical counseling, when we talk about doing a kind of counseling that is unique to the scriptures, we don't do that in an isolated way. We do that in the midst of a supermarket of approaches that disagree that God's solutions in the Bible are the correct solutions, that disagree that God's solutions are even appropriate in the context of the counseling room. The 20th century witnessed the ascendancy of a theological vision of reality that was devoid of the Word of God. Let me explain what that means. There were numerous counseling approaches in the 20th century that began to offer solutions to people's problems, answers to their questions, hope in the midst of their struggle that did not rely on the Word of God. Uh, these solutions were man-centered. Their understanding of problems was man-centered. We call this discipline now the discipline of psychology. Psychology is not all bad. There's all sorts of wonderful things that we can learn from psychology, and we're going to talk about that in a future lecture. But as psychology sought to do counseling, and to do counseling in a way that ignored God's revelation in Scripture, it created a competitor for God's wisdom. Most people don't appreciate it because we're so steeped in recent history, but for almost 2,000 years, when people had a problem in living, when they had a counseling-related problem, they went to a religious person for help. They went to their village pastor or to their village priest or to their rabbi. They went to somebody, that is to say, who had a commitment to the revelation of God in helping people sort out their problems. Um, in the 20th century, that began to go away as you have the, professionaliz the professionalization of secular wisdom. And now we live in a world where most people don't appreciate that counseling is a discipline that is informed by the scriptures, that is theologically informed. They think it's rather a secularly informed discipline. And there are numerous examples that we can look at of uh, secularists doing counseling. In a theology of biblical counseling, one of the things that I want to do is show that there are examples of secular counseling success and there are examples of secular counseling failure. We need to understand both of those if we're going to understand uh, how this works. Let's talk first about some uh, examples of secular counseling failure. There's a man by the name of Peter Kramer who has written a number of best-selling books on the issue of secular counseling. He's a Harvard-trained uh, therapist. He, uh, he's been doing counseling for years. And one of his early books is a book called Moments of Engagement, where he describes a counseling intervention with uh, a couple who was uh, about to get a divorce. The guy uh, was not interested in his wife. He was storing up money through some illegal sales that he was engaged in, and he was going to Vegas every year, blowing all the money and not telling his wife what he was doing. And as Kramer, uh, Dr. Kramer starts to try to figure out how to help this couple, he tells the wife, why don't you go to Vegas and do the same thing? Why don't you go to Vegas and buy a sexy dress and flirt with guys and blow a bunch of money and see if you can get him interested in you again? And uh, Kramer summarizes the work in the couple's life this way. He says, most of the cure lay in our one crafted instruction, go to Vegas and lose money. If anything, our intervention was too effective. Wendy flourished so dramatically that I began to fear for the marriage. Over a year after treatment stopped, Rick called me complaining that Wendy wanted to leave him. He sounded paranoid and clinically depressed. He was now even more involved with drugs than in the past. He showed up once or twice, but he never really turned into a patient, and my last impression of the couple was that they were about to divorce. Whether this outcome is desirable in a couple's treatment of this sort is hard to say. In individual therapy, we congratulate ourselves when a masochistic wife manages to leave a neglectful husband. In family therapy, we tend more to wonder whether the marriage couldn't have worked after all. Kramer says that his counsel to this couple led to what he understood to be a divorce that was coming. And he said it's hard to know whether it was successful or not. 
Uh, Kramer doesn't know whether his therapy was successful, but I think Christians, standing on the authority of the Word of God, could agree that this kind of therapy is not successful. We want to honor God's Word. We want to try to keep marriages together. We don't want to do things that lead to the splitting apart of a marriage. And we see here that Kramer engaged in a counseling intervention that was a counseling failure. Why did it fail? It failed for theological reasons. Kramer does not understand the teaching of the Word of God on marriage. He doesn't understand that this couple are people who are made in the image of God. He doesn't understand that they're people who have desires that are either moral or immoral as weighed in on by the Bible. He doesn't understand that we ought not try to fix a problem with more sin. And so Kramer's failures that he doesn't even understand to be failures are failures because of a theological failure. That's a pretty obvious and an easy one, though. Let's talk about counseling success, examples of secular counseling success. In fact, uh, there are people who get better uh, their problems uh, improve, they go away uh, when they go to secular counselors. Um, one of the most uh, common uh, therapeutic approaches today is that of cognitive behavioral therapy. It is, um, uh, there's a lot of research that demonstrates its effectiveness and a lot of people report feeling a lot better uh, after they go to cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, one of the best-selling books on this is a book called Feeling Good by David Burns. And uh, he advocates um, very well the approach of cognitive behavioral therapy. For Burns, uh, he believes that our negative emotions are the result of improper, unhelpful thinking. That's a typical approach from cognitive behavioral therapy. And he wants to try to help people uh, change their problems in living with an approach that he calls the triple column technique. And he, has, he des describes the technique by talking about a woman named Gail. This is what he says, start by writing down your automatic thoughts and rational responses for 15 minutes every day for two weeks and see the effect this has on your mood. You may be surprised to note the beginning of a period of personal growth and healthy change in your self-image. This was the experience of Gail, a young secretary whose sense of self-esteem was so low that she felt in constant danger of being criticized by friends. She was so sensitive to her roommate's request to help clean up their apartment after a party that she felt rejected and worthless. She was initially so pessimistic about her chances for feeling better that I could barely persuade her to give the triple column technique a try. When she reluctantly decided to try it, she was surprised to see how her self-esteem and mood began to undergo a rapid transformation. She reported that writing down the many negative thoughts that flowed through her mind during the day helped her gain objectivity. She stopped taking these thoughts so seriously. As a result of Gail's daily written exercises, she began to feel better and her interpersonal relationships improved by a quantum leap. Here's an example of counseling success based on an exercise that Burns teaches this woman and would encourage us to engage in, where you write down negative thoughts and write down more positive thoughts that would lead to better behaviors and better feelings. We need to be honest here that there are good things and bad things in Burns's technique. There are examples of faithful theology. First of all, the triple column technique sounds a lot like the Bible in some ways. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 5 to 6, we're told to take our thoughts captive to Christ. In Romans 12, 1 to 2, we're told that we're transformed by the renewal of our minds. And so Burns is on to something but he's not on to something because he came up with this. He actually has repeated an insight that God wrote down a couple thousand years before Burns was ever on the planet. And so Burns is actually piggybacking off a biblical idea that we shouldn't just sit back and think whatever we want, but we should take those thoughts captive and, and make them more fruitful. There's also elements of a faithless theology in Burns's system. First of all, God's absent. He doesn't understand Gail as being made in the image of God. He doesn't understand that God controls Gail's life. He, in fact, makes a determination that Gail's thoughts aren't helpful because they're not working for Gail. But he doesn't compare them to the Word of God. Gail felt terrible after her roommate's rejection of her. Should she have felt terrible? Well, 
We might agree that she should have felt terrible, but we would agree that because we would agree with that because we'd want to pay attention to what the roommate said. We'd want to judge that by the biblical standard for speech and decide whether it was kind or loving. Uh, and then we would want to help her change her thoughts, not based on just whatever would work, not ever would lead Gail to being more happy, but we would want to help her change her thoughts based on what God says we should think about ourselves and what God says uh, about our response to people that are in our life who would criticize us. So there's no standard for her thoughts. There's no powerful path to change. This is one of the most amazing realities in the Bible, is that God gives us his own resources to change. We're going to talk about that in the lectures to come. Uh, for the triple column technique, for Burns and for Gale, the power is the power of a pen and a paper and trying really hard. The biblical message is that the God who commands us to follow him gives us the grace and the strength and the resources to follow him by the resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. And so Christians have so many more rich resources to help struggling people like Gail uh, than Dr. Burns does. In the grand scheme of things, though we're thankful that Gail received some help and though we're thankful for the good things in Burns's system, we'd have to say all that on, we'd have to say that on margin, the theological error in his system is more significant than what is theologically faithful. Burns made Gail feel better, but he also made her a more productive worshiper of herself. He taught her, if we want to be really frank about it, how to go to hell more quickly and more easily. He made her feel good about a problem that she had, but he never was able to see her heart turn towards the living God and be changed from the inside out and be changed forever. Now, we're not upset with Dr. Burns about that. There's no evidence that he is a Christian. There's no evidence that he cares about the word of God. But we would want to be careful, lest we think as Christians that Burns has this rich reservoir of resources that as Christians we don't have. In fact, that's not true. Christians are the ones with the rich reservoir of resources, and Burns is just picking out little thimbles full of truth that he's able to scoop out, but he doesn't have the rich resources that the Bible has. So there is secular counseling. And it's out there, and we have to understand it as we pay attention to a faithful theology of counseling. We have to understand that there's going to be areas where they're right and there's areas where they're wrong, but we're also going to want to understand that those areas will be determined uh, via theology. It will be the truth of God's Word that will help us weigh in on what's good and what's bad. We also need to be honest as we wrap up this first lecture that this has been a source of great disagreement among Christians. Christians uh, have uh, been debating about these issues for about the last 40 or 50 years. There are some Christians who disagree with the case that I'm going to try to make that uh, the Bible is God's word to us telling us how to solve our counseling-related problems. Um, there's been a massive group of Christians who have believed that, hey, the Bible has a lot of good things to say, uh, but there's also all these wonderful things to say in secular psychology, and we need to put them both together. There's a number of different categories of people who do that. Some people call themselves integrationists. Some people call themselves Christian psychologists. We don't need to sort all that out right now. I'm just going to generally call that big group of people who wants to get some helpful resources from the Bible and other helpful resources from secular psychology. We'll just call those Christian counselors. And there are a lot of areas of agreement between biblical counselors and Christian counselors. Um, Biblical counselors and Christian counselors are conservative Christians. We believe in the resurrection. We believe in the authority of the word of God. Um, we care for hurting people. We want to love people. We, we look at people who are hurting and in pain, and we want to help them. Um, both sides believe that psychologists can say things and make observations that are helpful and true. A lot of people accuse biblical counselors of rejecting everything that comes from secular psychology. That's not true, and we're going to talk about that in the lectures ahead. Everybody agrees with that. Uh, we also, both sides agree that secular psychology gets some things wrong. A lot of people critique Christian counselors for saying, well, you just take everything secular psychologists say and you don't uh, evaluate it critically. That is also not true. Uh, Christian counselors are willing to throw out the findings of secular psychology when they can be proven to be unbiblical. 
Both sides also believe that not all problems are counseling problems. Everybody agrees that people can have medical problems that need physical care from a medical doctor and from other medical professionals. Um, but there are significant areas of disagreement between the two camps. Uh, one significant area of disagreement is whether it's necessary to use secular resources in counseling. Christian counselors are dying on the hill that it is necessary to use secular resources in counseling because the Bible doesn't tell us everything we need to know. Biblical counselors, on the other hand, are dying on the hill, that we really don't need secular resources in counseling because the Bible really does tell us everything we need to know about how to help people with their counseling problems. And that gets to the second area of disagreement, and it's about whether the Bible is a sufficient resource for counseling. The contention of Christian counselors for more than 50 years has been the Bible's a precious book, but it's not sufficient for counseling. And the contention of biblical counselors has been for that time that the Bible is a precious book and it is sufficient for counseling. And so that is the line of debate that we've got to sort out. But here's what I want you to understand right now. Is that debate is theological. Uh, that debate has to do with whether God reveals himself significantly to secular people to be able to help troubled folks. And that debate has to do with our understanding of the word of God. Does the word of God include the kinds of information that we need to help people who are struggling with problems? That's a theological investigation. And that's what we're going to do as we examine these issues together.